The big question is this, how do investors like us who don't have a PhD in finance or millions of dollars to start investing effectively grow our wealth with equities, bonds, cryptocurrencies, and more in a way that allows not only for short-term gains, but also significant long-term growth while staying true to our core? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. Hey, this is John. It's been about a year and a half since I shorted the market in February 2020 and subsequently held those positions into the very large COVID crash. I do not particularly know that COVID would be the reason the market crashed. I heard of it sparingly in early February, but I, I never really connected the dots with that. I was more so short the market because of economic factors like the inverted yield curve, which I made a video on here about. And aside from months and months of uh, just, you know, things at the top of my head that were very prevalent in my decision to short the market, things like Wall Street Journal headlines that say unemployment is at a 20 year or so low. It was a while ago. I have a picture of it, though, because something like that is extremely important. There is only extremely low unemployment right before it crashed in a vast majority of market conditions. I remember in like 2007 an article came out and it was about this hiring firm that was going to the local jail to recruit inmates before they'd been let out of jail, like three months before their release and have them signed up for a job to start working when they came out of jail. Because there were so few people to recruit, the employment was so phenomenal. And of course, that was right before the whole recession started. And so you'll notice over time, you, you can back test this. It happens over and over and over again. When you have extremely low unemployment, it's usually right before a crash. And seeing the Wall Street Journal headline, I think it was in November. I think it was in November. Uh, because I remember the inverted yield curve was in September. Uh, <laughs> if my memory doesn't fail me, it was a while ago. Uh, seeing those in, in combination with the inverted yield curve, you know you have about half of a year, uh, which actually turned out to be almost spot on. Uh, and then with the low unemployment, it was only magnified. And uh, again, I'm oversimplifying here, but seeing, for instance, the Tesla move in January showed very clearly an insanely high movement of funds into speculative and risky investments which again you'll see at the peak of investor confidence in the market. They're so confident that they'll put their money in extremely risky investments like buying Tesla after it quadruples to see it sextuple, which was awesome by all means. But just some economic indicators you can tell about money flow in the market and how that impacts the positions that you should be taking. So anyway, because of all those factors alongside, uh, again, I'm really simplifying months of research here, but. To, to put it briefly, those were kind of some big, some of the bigger ones. Uh, and then, of course, there was the GameStop fiasco, which, again, shows the same thing as, as the Tesla trade. We came into the position of February that the market was overbought, everything was going to crash. And I had had that mentality in the back of my head for at least half a year at that point. So just used some pretty basic technical analysis to find the most overbought securities I could. Uh, one of them, actually, through pure technical analysis, I'm like, wow, this is going to go down a bunch. Then I realized that they were actually in the process of merging with another company. So their stock price had really stabilized, but it was a really nice head and shoulders setup. And, oh, tickers. I'm so bad at tickers. Uh, Kemet. Kemet was the company. So I bought a bunch of naked puts on Kemet. And in February... And add, but I think the stock was at 25 and it was super low vol, so the puts were like a penny at 20 or something like that. And they just did really, really, really well. So when the market started crashing, obviously the VIX exploded, so the volatility, all the options premiums skyrocketed. And then most significantly for, uh, and I'm just mentioning Kemet, but there was like probably eight diver you know, diversified but all beta dependent positions that were primarily naked puts. Some of them were on companies like Apple, and remember there was a lot of pipeline companies. Aside from that, it, Kemet just stands out as, as probably the best example of what happened with these positions, with these naked puts that I took against the market. They went up by about 3,000%. Uh, by March 18th, most of them were at about four or if four to 6,000%. 
and a lot of the positions had March 18th expiration, but a vast bulk of them expired in, I would say, late April to June, which was right along the time frame of the technical charts that I was trading. Those time frames, the June time frames, were obviously conservative time frames. I usually try to put most of the position in a more conservative time frame. Uh, they weren't really based on like how long I think the market crash is going to last. That was solely technical analysis on the specific securities I was trading. Uh, but with all of those positions, they did very well much earlier than I thought they would, which I think makes sense because the COVID crash, to my knowledge, was the fastest crash in all of equities history in any short time period, uh, which was phenomenal for the positions. But it just wasn't exactly what I was expecting. So I had a little more time on there. And so the March 18th expiration options did probably two or three times better than any of the other contracts just because there was a small portion of them in there just for risk exposure and they ended up playing out really really well but it wasn't something like I'd bet everything on March 18th because that would just be a silly risk management move and so the 18th expirations did really really well I made a lot of money off those and then I had about 20 or so grand in profits that was that came from like a, maybe a grand high end and I was just sitting on that at March 18th. And at that point, I just felt like a superstar, like king of the world is doing so well. Um, you know, I'm like, oh, I shorted the market, yada, yada. And what's interesting is I remember back when Bitcoin peaked. I made a, a whole video on this. You can go back and see it. Uh, I remember when Bitcoin peaked, and the psychology, the investing psychology, the mentality that saw, I saw just everywhere when that went down with investors everywhere. It was really interesting because you'd see everyone saying, bye, 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 bye. When in reality, it was, you know, at least at the time, it was at the highest it would be for the next three years and the highest it had ever been. Uh, at around 20 or so large, and then it crashed down to, you know, eight, six, um, pretty nasty stuff. And so I had seen historically everyone being wrong in terms of thinking everything's going to go up. And then obviously it goes down. So I, I was pretty well versed at identifying stuff like that. And in 2021, that's what really helped me close out of most of the digital asset positions held in the fund at the peak of the market. And then later on, short the market when Bitcoin was at 64. But that's an entirely different story. Coming back here, this is the first time I had seen everybody saying sell, 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 sell. The market's crashing. The market's going down. Um, and I, it was very interesting because you saw every piece of media saying the market was going to crash. Even though when we, the position started, everyone was like, this is the best market ever. So obviously you would go against that, and that's what I did, and it worked out really, really well. But then it got to the point where you have people coming on TV saying that, like, the market's going to hell, the world's going to end, when in reality they're, you know, out in the back closing multi-billion dollar. I think, to my knowledge, most of it, was volatility futures trades uh, and then there was some of it on the t-bills futures notes that did really 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 well uh, those were, were some i mean that was a lot of foresight to make that trade on the uh, 10-year note treasury bills or the uh, zq is, is the ticker anyway because there were some people saying like the market's gonna crash and the world's gonna end and like as seemingly everywhere you looked on tv it was people saying talking about the stock market going down um, I very clearly should have seen that as, as an indicator that something was up, but I didn't. And instead I was kind of blinded by the success that I had had, and I was blinded by everybody saying that the world's going to end and the stocks are going to go down. And I just kind of ignored the fact that the positions had done incredibly phenomenally, much greater returns than I should have expected. Uh, or, and I just kept held, holding on to the positions, uh, and eventually they expired worth you know, fractions of what they were originally worth or got sold for fractions of what they were originally worth. And I think probably the thing that really killed me, because that wouldn't have killed me, I'd still be perfectly fine. Uh, but the thing that really killed me is that I moved all of the money I'd made from shorting the market into further shorting the market on like the 18th to the week after. Uh, and not all of it, obviously, but, but a decent chunk of it. And those ended up being some of the worst performing investments I'd ever had. And they were all with profit, and they only cut the total profit by, I would say, half, which isn't the worst thing ever. But 
it really did start to kind of tumble downhill after there because I didn't really fully understand that that, to the extent that we can look back at it now, was the bottom. And there was just the miscalculation in terms of what that actually meant. So a lot of lessons learned there. But the biggest one is that not only do you have really high marks where everyone says buy and you can tell that's the end, but when you also have really low marks where everyone says sell, you can tell that's the end. And, you know, it's one I should have known, but it just kind of slipped a little bit. So, uh, uh, but at the end of the day, great learning from that. And I am very thankful for it because that failure, I personally believe, was the biggest factor that contributed to moving into, for the next year, doing all the currency futures positions with the fund, which I consider invaluable. Uh, and that was just really awesome. I could talk all day about that. That'll be uh, another thing, but I've just had some time to really think about the psychology and the experiences I had shorting the market, and especially at, like the bottom, uh, and how that felt internally. And what I realized was the same thing I realized when we had really, really well-performing investments early on when I didn't really understand how to balance psychology. I would be you know, telling everyone, like, wow, look at how well these stocks are doing, or wow, look at how well these, these currency investments are doing. And really, you know, any, at any time when you ever see yourself doing that, you can very easily tell that you have hit an extremum in the market. And, you know, the moment investing stops being like, quote unquote, boring, is the moment where you really have to start reconsidering the positions. And normally that would have been fine. I would have just gone along with that. But the challenge here and what went wrong is I was so overconfident in the positions and so um, inflated from my past success, you know, the, the really nice successes with it, that I stopped doing the fundamental research and just stopped doing the fundamental technical analysis. And I really strongly believe that I, I just continued to, you know, follow the path and do the right analysis. It, it was pretty obvious there were some pretty serious hammer bottoms in a lot of these positions. And I just didn't even bother to look at the charts. And I was busy at the time with school, yada, yada, whatever. Those are all kind of excuses. Um, it really came down to just not focusing enough on it after I'd had all that success. And, uh, and then because of that, it all kind of washed, uh, a, a decent chunk of it kind of washed away. So, at <laughs> the end of the day, I, I'm mentioning all this to you because there are two series about to come out on this channel. The first one is one I recorded about three years ago, so uh, very, very young. <laughs> And uh, uh, anyway, I'm really proud of it. I really enjoy what's in it. It's about dark pools and making trades based off of extremely large institutional orders that really move the market but aren't traditionally reported or sometimes even hidden from the market. Uh, it's based on some groundbreaking public knowledge revealed by Stephanie Cameraman, and I'm just very excited for that one. It's really cool. Everything in that I used in the fund for years, and it just works really, really, really well. And was honestly, it, it helped even with identifying to short the market based on just, you know, prints on traditional indices and also volatility indices. So I'm really excited about that one. That one's going to be superb. After the Dark Pool Secrets Masterclass, there's a series coming out. And honestly, this is very reminiscent and, and very, this very much showcases how out of focus I was at the time based on like blinding myself with success is a series that I recorded, kid you not, the weekend of March 18th, which at the time I didn't even think about. Looking back, I feel like a total doofus. I should have been spending that time really reevaluating my positions, not recording some series on, uh, anyway. My fault, can't do anything about it now. Good news is that at the expense of all of those returns and me doing actual proper research, you guys get what I think is a really, really nice series on fundamental stock analysis. It's going to be based on a series of stocks. Um, some of them were just darts on a wall that I thought would make really interesting videos because I didn't know anything about them. And I wanted to take you through the process I would go through, going from stage zero, not knowing anything about a company, to bam, you know, going through the annual report, going through the financials, and going through future um, projections. And obviously, it's a truncated process of what would traditionally be maybe a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe 
even months sometimes scanning for stocks or analyzing companies. It just depends on how deep you want to go into it and how much you want to rely on technical analysis versus fundamentals. But I'm really excited about that one because it has a nice blend of technical and fundamental. And they're a little bit longer videos, but they're also going to really walk you through some of the depths if you've never really fully analyzed a company for investment before on what to look for and some of the big key factors to find. And I'm really excited with how it came out. I, want to, uh, I wanted to share with you this with you, though. First, especially when it was recorded, I was extremely, extremely bearish on the market at the time. So at the end, I'll be like, and obviously it's not investment advice, and again, this was recorded like a year and a half ago, so it's very irrelevant and shouldn't be taken or construed as advice, yada, yada. Uh, but at the end, I'm like, oh, okay, so I would like short this or not short this or, or do puts on some of them. Most of them I'm kind of indifferent because most of the stocks you analyze, you won't do a trade on just because of how the numbers work. Um, but for some of them, I am pretty pretty bearish on it just because of my view of the market at the time. So just take it with a grain of salt. It's not a big part of it. And I am really excited about it because there's a lot of really nice information in both of those masterclass series. So with that said, that is my story of the COVID crash. <laughs> uh, one that has uh, no doubt shaped me as an investor in the future. And also a couple of really cool masterclasses coming out that you can look forward to. So thank you guys so, so much and have an awesome one. See ya. Hey, this is John. I hope you enjoyed the podcast episode. Now listen, if you want to get more stock market secrets and really understand the fundamentals and advanced techniques of investing straight from a hedge fund manager, then go to 9toNoonSecrets.com and claim your free copy of my bestseller, 9 to Noon, so that you can go from zero to 100 in personal finance and master the investing markets.